It is the 1st of August, 1806. A squadron of ships approaches the breakwaters at the port of Coro, Venezuela. Their cargo? 600 armed British and American nationals and one Venezuelan, Francisco de Miranda. Miranda had seen an illustrious military career fighting in the Gulf Coast campaign in 1781 and serving in the War of the First Coalition as a general in the French army. Miranda had been, until now, hiding in the United States from the Spanish Inquisition, stepping back on Spanish soil for the first time in years to liberate his country from European rule. He had been assured during his time in exile that the people of Venezuela would rise up upon his arrival and rid themselves of their Spanish chains. To Miranda's surprise, he found Coro practically deserted. After 10 days of proclaiming his radical decrees with only the goats and chickens to hear him, Miranda was forced to re-embark back into exile when 1,500 Spanish troops arrived to retake the town. All that was left in his wake was a pile of manifestos that had not even been distributed. Such was the fervor for independence in late 1806. To understand the collapse of Spain's empire, you must first know it did not begin in the sweltering jungle and hills of South America, but in an ocean away, in the Spanish heartland of the Iberian Peninsula. In 1808, Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte, that Corsican revolutionary who brought Europe to his knees, had turned on their once staunch ally during the invasion of Portugal. The Spanish Bourbon monarchy, including Kings Charles IV and Ferdinand VII, were forced by Napoleon to abdicate. In their stead, Napoleon would make his older brother, Joseph Bonaparte, as the new King of Spain. The collapse of the old monarchy caused a domino effect on central and provincial government, splintering Spain into a multitude of military hunters fighting for a return of the old monarchy or supporting Napoleon's puppet. This meant that the vice royalties governing Spain's colonies were cut off from any central command, being essentially left on their own. Until now, Spain's colonies in the Americas ruled with an iron fist. After more than three centuries of rule, any colonial grievances were swiftly diffused. This strategy of divide and rule could not be better exemplified through Spain's complex racial segregation system. At its most basic level, you had the Peninsulares, whites born in Spain, Unsurprisingly, they were at the top of the system. Below them were the Creole, whites who were born in the Americas. At the bottom of the hierarchy were the indigenous peoples and Africans. However, racial integration was common and subcategories were made for every combination. Peninsulares had no restrictions and usually held the most important posts. The same is true with the Creole, but they were exempt from the highest positions of colonial power. The indigenous and African families provided the hard labor, working in mines, ranches and plantations. It wasn't just the state that held sway over the lives of its citizens. The church had a close affinity with the lower castes of colonial society. Parish priests often protected the natives from the worst exploitations. These priests were often a part of the lower classes themselves and had little in common with the church's upper hierarchy. Despite all this, economic problems were one of the biggest factors in colonial discontent. 
but it covered all social classes. Creole merchants buckled under the ironically named Comercio Libre, or free commerce policies, which solely benefited Spain instead of its colonies. Exports could only be carried out by trusted trading partners, whilst local industries suffered due to cheap imports. The lowest native classes also had to pay forced tributes of money and labour to colonial authorities and the local nobility, who kept the population in order, acting as surrogate rulers. These deep-rooted issues would drive the colonies towards further autonomy. However, it is debated that it was only the collapse of the Spanish monarchy that sparked the fuse for revolution. The first South American republics, universally known as the Patriots, were nothing to write home about. Fraught with internal division and a lack of unity, they were a long way from the South American republics we know today. Despite having limited resources, Spain's New Granada Viceroyalty was vigorously opposed to the Junta movement. When hearing about a Junta being formed in Quito in August 1809, he dispatched troops to restore order. Ringleaders and pro movements would be rounded up whilst militia patrolled the streets. However, this would not stop news of further Spanish defeat in the Peninsular War. Cartagena, a major trade port, would form a junta in June 1810. By July the 20th, the Viceroy was forced by a mob to allow a junta into the capital of Bogota itself, though it would not stop him from being deposed five days later. The new hunters immediately set upon each other over the key issue of centralized government or a loose confederation. In the end, they agreed upon confederation, all except for Bogota. After talks broke down, they separated from the now united provinces of New Granada, forming the rump state of Cundinamarca, forcing the New Granadan government to change their seat to Cartagena. To the east, the Spanish captaincy of Venezuela faced a large-scale revolt. A junta being formed in Caracas in April 1810 led to most neighboring provinces to join their side. Though were sandwiched by the remaining royalist provinces of Guayana and Maracaibo. The neighboring city of Coro also remained a royalist stronghold. Caracas was the honcho of Venezuela, being a major trading city they were able to throw their influence around. Though their influence wouldn't save them when the Caracas Junta sent their representatives to Coro for peace talks, where they were welcomed as prisoners. A 4,000-man force was sent by Caracas to take Coro. Meeting the royalist force in the outskirts, they were defeated in July 1810 despite half the opposing force only bearing spears and bows. To meet this threat, Francisco de Miranda and his protege, Simone Bolivar, were radical voices in the wartime Congress, declaring an independent Venezuelan Republic. The Spanish responded by sending three companies of regulars from Santa Marta. Marines were also disembarked at Coro joined by local militia. Miranda was declared dictator of Venezuela on March 25, 1810, to counter the invasion and to take back towns like Valencia, which had flipped to the royalist side. The next day, central Venezuela was rocked by an earthquake, with 10,000 dead in Caracas alone. The royalist clergy used the earthquakes to show God's judgment on a rebellious people. Whilst Miranda was still getting his men out of the rubble, royalist forces were fast approaching. With 5,000 men, Miranda defeated their army outside Valencia, pushing into the city through street-to-street -street fighting. However, 
he refused to finish off the Royalists while they were down. Meanwhile, Bolivar had lost the port of La Puerta to an uprising of Royalist prisoners. Patriot morale had collapsed on the 12th of March. Miranda would surrender Caracas, escaped on board a British vessel along with what was left of the treasury, only to be apprehended by Royalists and sent to mainland Spain in chains.